science is synonymous with uh, peer review, specifically pre-publication peer review. Uh, the public seems to trust science, and those that do science, at least in part, due to the system where highly educated peers check the quality and, it, and often importance of the work of others. Um, so the arsenic life story um, last year um, highlighted the sort of the utility of post-publication peer review and the importance of it, and brought into sort of the stark relief the fallibility of traditional pre-publication peer review. So in this discussion, uh, we'll cover the options for sort of the different types of post-publication peer review and look at their benefits and drawbacks. Um, so we are joined by two guests, uh, Carl uh, Odiger, uh and Jarrett Burns. Uh, Carl, will you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm a graduate student at UC Davis. I work in population biology on a variety of questions around regime shifts in ecology and evolution. Cool. Uh, Jarrett, can you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Uh, so I'm Jarrett Burns. I'm a postdoc at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. Um, I work, I'm a community ecologist and a, a marine ecologist, so I mostly look at um, kelp forests and biodiversity and ecosystem function, um, community ecology and climate change in general. Great. So I see that uh, someone has joined us already, uh, and if other people do, just um, feel free to um, tweet at me questions or uh, let us know if you want to ask a question, we can get you in. So, um, I guess to start off, uh, the traditional post-publication commentary has has been, you know, peer-reviewed letters, letters and articles. So, publication uh, paper gets published, and then somebody uh, publishes a, a comment on that, and then the original people uh, are allowed to comment on that um, before uh, before it all gets published. So, is that is that still the way to go? Do you guys still sort of agree with that general model? Carl? Let's have Jared take the first whack at that. I'll, <laughs> I'll try to take a contrary position to whatever you say for entertainment value only. <laughs> okay, this will be fun then, um, since I'm sure we largely agree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's... I don't think anyone will dispute the role of peer review in mediating kind of the acceptance of science. Um, we currently do peer review under one model, the sort of two to three reviewer model mediated by an editor where it's all closed uh, and the sort of the general scientific public and the, and the public in, in general, depending on access issues, uh, doesn't see that work until uh, it's gone through and has been accepted by those reviewers or at least a, a plurality of those reviewers and an editor. Um, after that, it's kind of fair game and there are a couple of different pathways that a paper can take. Um, the traditional pathways that if you want to respond to a paper that you should write a paper of your own. There are certain journals that will take, uh, you know, kind of a, you can write a note, you can write a commentary, you can write a rebuttal, and that goes through the standard peer review format as well quite often. Um, so that's kind of how things are done. Um, there's, there's sort of a second pathway where you can write a full paper, and that will also go through the peer review product, uh, whole sort of process again, uh, which will generally take con a considerably longer time than just a note or comment if that's even available. Um, in fact, it can take a really long time. It, it can, can take up to a year, two years, three years, however long it takes to get through peer review. Now, kind of on the side, um, you have the what's developed. You have a, a culture of preprints that's arisen in, in other disciplines, not ours certainly, um, which is a place where you can have a much quicker exchange of ideas. Um, you also have sort of the growing um, responses that can come out of blogs, etc. So you kind of have the online science uh, movement growing. Personally, I, you know, I prefer a more rapid dialogue. Um, I think that the that science can advance more quickly in the open. It can advance more quickly if you actually have um, some kind of conversation going on. Um, that said, if you really want an intensive, data-heavy, uh, do reviewers really agree with this comment or is somebody just spouting off, you need the review process, or you need some form of review process. Um, I don't think we're actually really configured to deal with that sort of rapid exchange of ideas that's mediated through a, a sort of rapid peer review currently. Um, it's something that I favor. I definitely favor a quicker exchange, uh, but there's got to be some sort of check or balance in there as well, um, or at least sort of a, a place where you can have a healthy, robust discussion. 
So that's yeah. kind of maybe a little tangential, but that's that's sort of my take on it. It's slow right now. The way that you can communicate in sort of the publicly accepted science, uh, particularly in ecology and evolutionary biology right now, is slow, but it, it works. I have to agree with Jared that the, the real loss that we get is speed. Uh, if you look at the example that Scott started us off with in Arsenic Life, for instance, you know, two days after the article is out, the press release is out, there is this fascinating post-publication peer review that's occurring entirely on the blog space, right? And it's not until, I think it's five months later that we see the first, you know, peer-reviewed replies. And, of course, the author's positions at the time, the defending their work, they were not at all entertained by the non-peer-reviewed discussion going on in, in the blog spots. It's a strange description to call it non-peer-reviewed. I mean, it's a discussion of peers about the work. But it differed in an important way from a letter that would go to science, for instance, as a comment on their piece. That letter would have been reviewed by the authors themselves, and they would be able to write their reply, and their reply would appear simultaneously with the other piece. So there's a lot of things that get lost from that blog discussion that, you know, in exchange for that speed, and that's important that we ask, you know, do we need those elements? Um, can we recreate those elements? Or maybe these ecosystems just live side by side, performing different roles. There's a role for speed. There's a role for impact. There's a role for archiving. There is, to some extent, the role for connected to impact. Uh, how else will it affect people's careers? Um, you might argue that even if a blog has, for instance, significant reach in terms of readership, they may not have the same impact in terms of, you know, assessing the quality of future faculty. Right. So I'll, I'll jump in. <coughs> I think I see yeah. a place I can throw a contrary opinion in, at least for the fun of it. Just throw out a straw mat. So I, I actually think the, the great tragedy of things like arsenic life um, is that the interaction, so first off, I think the, the, the great thing about the way the arsenic life blog side work is that there was an intense discussion um, between peers in the sort of blogosphere about the paper, about perceived drawbacks. Um, and there was actually an open discussion about responses. I mean, Rosie Redfield actually posted her response on her blog for people to comment and discuss uh, before we went to science. In many ways, I feel like that's peer review at its greatest. You're actually throwing your ideas out there. You're soliciting opinions. Um, you're, you're having an open discussion. On the other hand, you didn't have a discussion with the authors of the original paper. Now, granted, that was certainly a much more contentious case. Um, so there's going to be some really funny politics around that. Um, but you can imagine a case where if someone p puts a paper out there, and uh, as an author, I mean, I would really enjoy a discussion um, about a piece of my work that I feel like makes a contribution and there's something to talk about. There can be a rapid exchange of ideas um, between peers. Uh, I, I feel like that's something that we haven't really broken into yet, where one can go out and really discuss a piece of, of work between authors uh, and, and peers, uh, view them as reviewers, either pre- or post-publication review. I feel like there's a, there's a lot of potential for uh, much more rapid advancement of science there and a much more sort of frank and robust scientific conversation um, that we haven't tapped yet. I feel like this, it's kind of this latent, um, untapped thing floating out there. And everybody kind of stares at it periodically from the side and says, oh, that would be really great, but I don't know if I want to make that jump. Um, but I feel like it's a jump that would be so good for science. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any examples of that in practice, Jared? Uh, no, not really. Um, I'm going to guess that that might be, there may be some good examples outside of our discipline. I'm trying to think of a really good example of an exchange between um, authors and collaborators and peers and reviewers that's, that's generated a, a response to a piece in the peer review literature in the post-publication world. Um, I mean, I can think about pre-publication examples of that. You have sort of the, uh, for example, the infamous example of Tim Gowers posting a, a, a problem, mathematical problem that he wanted to work on and some thoughts that he had, and that's starting up a whole dialogue that led to uh, solutions, led to answers, led to sort of an advancement of science. So in the pre-publication process, you may be more likely to get that, that sort of um, interchange of ideas because people don't feel like they're taking their work and sending it into a more formalized place. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
Sorry, sorry to jump in here. Maybe I That's should. I should say who I am. Sure. Yeah, uh, introduce yourself, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jamie Ashender. I'm at UC Davis. I'm a PhD student in uh, population biology. Carl. And um, I was just gonna gonna raise uh, a point further to to the one Jared's talking about here is that um, so is it a critical aspect of this that might be implicit but has hasn't been raised explicitly is. Uh, the openness, I guess, right? So I, I've heard uh, anecdotes of people having very um, very productive dialogues with reviewers or commenters that led to, to papers, and the one that I'll pass along is from, from Steve Elner, where he, he made a comment on a paper by Ellie Holmes that was in Ecology Letters. Uh, she commented back, and they ended up writing a joint paper instead of a back-and-forth commentary, and I think you can see that. That he's the first author on that. It's uh, Holmes and Elner, 2008 or something, and they sort of discussed that fact in the intro paragraph, and it's kind of cool. Um, but you know, so that might be a great example of a, a night nice back and forth, but it's not out on the blogs or it's not on the preprint servers. Um, so what does openness add? I mean, it, it means a, an expert from across the world can jump in, but it also means maybe there's a cacophony of people who think they're experts uh, from across the world and and that could, could be a negative uh, side to that as well. Maybe. Yeah, I feel like the most important thing about the current, uh, the current peer review system as is is that it is mediated, that you have an editor, an editorial decision-making process that mediates decisions on reviews. So reviews can get weighted differently. Um, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's, it's a, a way of kind of translating uh, what could be a lot of noise, depending on who your reviewers are, into a really meaningful decision about a piece of work. Um, so, I, you know, I think you're right, Jamie. I think some form of mediation is key. Um, but it's true. You know, you have a lot of, I mean, okay, the plural of anecdote isn't data, but you do have some great <laughs> anecdotal examples of peer review uh, of, of there actually being a discussion. Um, or if you look at, there, there's actually some example of this out in the literature. There's not a lot of uh, literature that I'm aware of on the peer review, but there are, there have been a couple of double-blind studies, there have been a couple of sort of games that have looked at it. So for example, if you look at the Leak et al. 2012 paper in PLOS One, that's a really nice example of both a, a model as well as then actually a small game experiment showing how an open peer review can actually uh, improve papers more uh, than closed peer review. And there are some really interesting references in that Leak paper that go into um, some kind of double-blind studies of the peer review process. Some of which show, eh, it doesn't do so much, but others show that uh, either an increased uh, acceptance rate or increased improvement in quality of the paper. So the, the evidence is mixed. Um, and I haven't yet found a formal meta-analysis on this, but it seems like kind of science point to this being a productive thing uh, at improving the quality of science that's coming out. Hmm. So the, the new, the new uh, PeerJ journal, um, we watched an interview the other day with uh, Dr. Kiki, uh, and they talked about um, open peer review, but they were going to encourage people that it wasn't mandatory. Um, and so it seems like even even the newest journals are still sort of uh, cautious to require open peer review. Do you think it's sort of do you think it's eventually going to happen? Uh, a good case study comes from the EMBO journal. Um, another one, Biology Direct, has been doing it for a long time, but EMBO made a policy in which on acceptance, the reviews would be published as a supplement to the paper. And Nature wrote a piece on it recently saying, you know, look, overall the assessment is this system has worked pretty well. Now it's slightly different than Biology Direct's one, which is a bit more extreme, in which case the paper can be published if the authors want it to, regardless of what the reviews say. Whereas the reviews you're seeing in EMBO are only the reviews of papers that were ultimately accepted. So if there was a fundamental disconnect between what the authors thought and what the reviewers thought, and the paper is not, you know, not accepted there, goes somewhere else, that kind of discussion is lost. Uh, in the EMBO model, they were also able to say how many people look at those reviews and whether they find them useful, and they put it at about one in ten were accessing, downloading the reviews along with the paper, which they said was right on par with accessing supplementary materials. So those people that were going deeper into the papers were going deeper into their reviews, and they were finding it about as useful. 
So, you know, I think PeerJ is looking at that kind of thing and saying, yeah, you know, sure, having that review out there in some form. Mm -hmm. There's a question of should that be anonymous, blah, blah, blah. So right. POS1 possibly. kind of, uh, POS1 likewise in their policy, just taking a look at it, they, they also allow uh, the posting of reviews as well. Um, it, it seems like there's sort of a decision process that goes through that. But again, um, I've read a couple of papers in there where the reviews have been posted, and quite often they're, they're really helpful. Um, more often not, they've been sort of the positive re reviews that highlight why this piece of work is, is important, what new ground this piece of work breaks. So it's kind of a nice little condensed nugget of, uh, you know, why this is, is something good. And, and I've actually found that really quite useful. Mm -hmm. I think it's useful in the discussion of peer review to really pull out the two fundamental mm -hmm. objectives, which I think are very different, and we always lump them together, right? Mm -hmm. There's this, like, scientific validity of the issue, mm -hmm. and there's the importance of the issue. Like, we, we want peer review to be this filter for us and say, like, this is the stuff I have to read, this is the stuff I should read, and this is the stuff that's not worth reading. But we also want it to be the gatekeeper of this is valid science and this is not valid science. And they're really different objectives. And um, a, an approach that solves one of those well may not address one of the others well. And I think, you know, the jury may still be out on whether the formal channels are doing one better than the other, they do both better, or the informal channels, the internet channels, the social media do both better. But I think, yeah, maybe we could, mm -hmm. people could take a stab at that, you know. Want someone to take a stand and say, I think formal peer review does the oversight of the, the validity of science better, for mm -hmm. instance. Yeah, post-publication peer review definitely, at least as, it, as it's currently done, um, since you see more examples of I really like this paper rather than let's dig into uh, a paper and kind of tease out its flaws, it really seems to be kind of looking at scientific importance rather than validity. Um, it's rare that you see kind of challenges to validity or challenges to analyses. Like I've been really interested to look at Bob O'Hara's blog and kind of some of the, the questions that he's posted there lately. I actually think that that's something that, uh, you know, I wish I saw more. I feel like there was a nice, fiery, feisty discussion there that was incredibly useful to talk about some methodological techniques and really bring to fore an issue that um, it's important for people to, go to address and think about. It's a funny space. Um, I mean, we are really in a post-publication review. I mean, we're talking about post-publication review, and that's, that's really all that's, that's available at this point. And there's a question of scale. You brought up the, the speed as a big advantage of the uh, internet media in pursuing a post-publication review. I think that we're never going to lose the, the formal responses to journals, and obviously they can bring a lot of value in that time. But mm -hmm. it's not just a time delay, I think. There's a scale problem that there is so much literature, and it's not all going to get you know, <laughs> a back-and-forth commentary in Nature or PNAS about yeah. what's going on there. So, you know, where is the post-publication review for the other things? I think Jared raises an interesting question there of, you know, is it working? Mm -hmm. Like, there's, do we want it? Is it going to be better? But then there's also, is it working? Can we incentivize it? There's mm -hmm. certainly an active, you know, research blogging community. There's people that are describing, you know, their thoughts on publications. But, you know, how much value is that adding? Is there enough of that? Do we need more? Do we need more of it to assess importance? Do we need, or is importance covered, and we need more of it to really go after, you know, the, the Bob O'Hara, like, is this method valid? You know, are these conclusions really supported by the data? Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of incentivizing, it seems like, um, do, you th do you think giving a, a comment to DOI basically solves the problem of incentivizing because you, you can pretty much put it on your, on your CV? Mm -hmm. So sort of F1000 does that with their reviews, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think... I think maybe some other venues do, but I know F1000 seems like the obvious one here. Mm -hmm. Well, they have kind of the brand name support of it too, right? Where, yeah. you know, either someone can say my paper was reviewed or I am a reviewer, and it, and it seems to carry some cachet that uh, mm -hmm. having appeared on, you know, well-known blog, Tree of Life, or Angela or something, may not, like, comment on that, may not look so good on a CV, even though it may reach, you know, two orders of magnitude more eyeballs. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's changing, maybe it's not. I've been really curious to follow sort of the growth in alt metrics. So there's the alt metrics, I think it's that com or org site that allows you to track. There's actually, a, a, you know, they're great little bookmarklet, so you can be looking at a paper, click the bookmarklet, see how many blog articles are there about this piece, how many times has 
as it made its way around. I, I feel like that's been really nice. Or um, Heather Pewellwar's Total Impact site. Um, I think it's Total Impact. Again, I can't remember if it's that org or that info. Um, but again, just like a fantastic way of, of bringing together those metrics. Uh, what's been curious, and I've kind of taken a look at it, is some of those sites are beginning to build um, an API where you can actually pull out, like for your CV, you can pull out information from that and actually link that to an article. So someone can take a look at your CV and see how many people have it sitting in their Mendeley libraries, how many people um, have blogged about it, how, how much of a response is your work generating, is your work something that's actually out there. Um, so I feel like that's definitely one step on the road towards one of these, uh, towards sort of formal, uh, a sort of an alternate assessment besides just something like number of citations. Uh, so those are clearly going towards the import, addressing the important side of the work. Yep. You know, not addressing the validity side of the work, mm -hmm. but no one would confuse the two in that in that case. Yes, uh, definitely, definitely. Does that, if if they become a more dominant way to assess importance, then do we need other? Ch where does the validity end? Up? Is that just do we rely on that in the pre-publication peer review, or more post-publication peer review blogs should be attacking, or you know, all these <laughs> challenging validity questions? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really different question. Um, I mean, from my, as I was, I've been really intrigued to watch, for example, the researchblogging.org community grow up and watch the kinds of post-publication peer review that comes out of there. Um, you know, it's not associated with a DOI. It's not formally associated with the paper. There's really, with the exception of now the Altmetrics site, there's no way to necessarily go from a paper to find all of the blog articles that uh, discuss the paper, which has always been kind of frustrating. There's no real paper trail, as it were, of people's commentary on your work. Um, but people have been very slow to jump into criticizing validity. Um, we are acclimated to a culture of closed pre-publication peer review, so to jump into that afterwards and sort of openly challenge validity questions, particularly for the more early career researchers that you see uh, have, have more flocked to sort of online communication about science um, media, it's really difficult. It, it's putting yourself on the line in a way that I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with. Um, you know, yeah. it's that don't say something mean uh, about someone unless you can say it to their face, and then you kind of guard your yourself quite a bit more. Um, in terms of reputation, it's something that I, I know a lot of people are very wary of. So, yeah, I think so that's a fundamental well, tension. What about the other side of the coin? That uh, so uh, Ted Hart, who's a postdoc at UBC, just tweeted about uh, the other like if it's. Uh, Probably older, uh, more senior uh, scientists are, have the potential to be more abrasive uh, than, than younger scientists. And, and, you know, I mean, that, that can be bad, too. If, you know, just as bad as maybe not being able to, not feeling like you can say anything. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that might turn people off from, from commenting or, you know, just get people's hackles up and so they're not focused on science. Mm -hmm. Anyway. No, no, I think that's a, that's a really good point. Um, I mean, to me, I think the biggest problem with post-publication peer review right now is that it is so distributed um, that it's very difficult to find sort of a centralized discussion about a paper, even after it's out there. I mean, sure, you can kind of sift through altmetric, or you can poke around to different blogs and look at research blogging. Org, but it's, it's difficult in ecology and evolutionary biology to find sort of a central clearinghouse of discussions about the literature. Um, we don't have kind of a, a central place that every ecologist goes in the morning to see what's the latest that's out there and talk about it. Um, that, that just doesn't exist online. Um, so it, in many ways, I feel like a lot of the, the questions that at least I have and I think others have about post-publication peer review about its utility, about maybe incorporating more criticism and discussion of validity, uh, about evaluating both positive and negative importance of a piece. Um, I feel like we don't have a good mechanism for that right now. I feel like there's not a really good way that we can kind of gather together uh, and interact. I mean, that, that's really still the domain of the hallway conversation or sort of uh, email or meetings. But there's not really a good centralized place for discussion of literature, 
um, online, where you can see who's being abrasive, who's not being abrasive, or you can actually have that criticism of if someone jumps in and completely trashes a paper for unjustifiable reasons that people can say, what are you talking about? Um, that just doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. Carl, you, you kind of hit on two challenges for that, right? You, there's the kind of discoverability of the things in no central mm -hmm. place, right, which maybe mm -hmm. is more of a problem with technology. But there's kind of the social challenge of that comfort that, you know, and perhaps that will never be there, right, that you will have the same comfort in having the discussion with the guy down the hall about how terrible that paper is mm -hmm. as in front of the whole world. It's kind of ironic that the, the, the lack of discoverability seems like it should make it a bit safer to, you know, say what you want since it's not perhaps as broadcasted, but uh, mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no real security there. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to what extent um, technology is starting to play a role in that second sphere, right, where, mm -hmm. as you said, it's not just down the halls, it's now over an email discussion that these things occur, or mm -hmm. it's through a social network that has walls on it, whether that's Facebook or G Plus or any of the others, mm -hmm. in which there's some discussion going on, but it's going on with a, a known set of people, mm -hmm. um, and perhaps that discussion is more candid. And if so, is there a way, at least then years, or there's kind of a captured record of that, um, mm -hmm. is there a way to say, oh, well, that was a good discussion, and uh, mm -hmm. there's nothing that's too offensive there. Maybe we can expose that to the public. Yeah. But, I mean, maybe, maybe in every discussion, you know, on Facebook, or, well, I don't know about Facebook, if they, do they expose their API publicly? Um, uh, <laughs> you could put a DUI in in every discussion for a paper you're talking about, <laughs> and, then, and then capture all the discussions across the web on a paper. Facebook DOIs. Yeah, well, uh, DOIs for the paper that you're talking about. Yeah. And then you and then you can search for that DOI. And, uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No, I mean, like, I I think one of the most valuable um, one of the most valuable examples of post-publication peer review that I've been seeing recently are the the email discussions that have been posted on the Sea Monster. Mm -hmm. I feel like the Sea Monster, um, you know, Emmett Duffy and John Bruno have been doing an awesome, awesome job of taking some contentious papers or contentious uh, opinion pieces and having a really open and frank discussion with a lot of uh, different scientists that are involved in that field. You know, I've learned as much often from those discussions, if not more, than I have from the individual papers. Um, and I feel like if there was a, a, a sort of a more uniform forum where those sorts of discussions could take place, that would be a huge, huge benefit to our field. But ecology is so big. I mean, should, should we expect there to be a uniform forum? I mean, it, isn't it as valuable to have sort of a, a, a thousand flowers, like a, yeah. a bunch of different small fora where, where yeah. people interact? This, this does sort of, sort of mimic science in, in general, or maybe departments or something where we might interact with, with other people and talk about how a paper's great or a paper's bad or this is what's wrong and let's get this idea out there and then, um, I mean, it it does seem like a great a great vision to be able to interact with, with everyone or, or but, but maybe this kind of old metric stuff is, is the way to tie all these things together. It seems like people are already doing that, so. I mean, I feel like to some extent it's a, a tipping point problem, like it's one of the, the sort of classic network assembly issues where what we have right now is a very distributed network. It's very sparsely connected. Um, you know, I as an individual scientist need to do a lot of reaching out to connect to other parts of the network, in particular parts of the network, uh, people talking about papers that I don't even know who they are um, or that they exist. There's not, there's not really a good way for me to discover and participate in those conversations or for even those conversations to take place um, and inform one another. I mean, you could have a single paper and have five separate conversations going on about it, but those, those separate conversations located in their separate places, um, there's no cross-pollination between the two of them. And that's, you know, that's going to slow things down. That's going to um, impede the quality of the conversation, honestly. Yeah, I think getting people into the conversation, that's something that we can we're getting better at as there are more networks that are emerging, just like the whole connectivity is improving, right? Mm -hmm. And while I agree it's still hard, like my chances of discovering it because it might come through any of a multitude of feeds from, mm -hmm. it's no longer just what my office mate sees and what I see, right? And what, right. you know, now it's, if anybody on Twitter sees it or on another network, I, you increase your chances. 
Yeah. That doesn't get to your, you know, the second challenge, right, of like, well, how do we make those discussions also maintain that kind of frankness that, that they don't have? Mm. And it, it seems like there's a potential for that to, to be a great benefit as well as, you know, it's going to come with some risk that, you mm -hmm. know, you're criticizing the authors. But that doesn't have to be a career-destroying move, of course. You know, mm -hmm. the rest of the community might say, oh, so-and-so is really clever for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. but, it, but it has that risk, and we don't have many showcase examples where mm -hmm. you can see the indirect benefits. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows that, you know, what the direct cost is. Like, if nobody else reads that comment, well, the author of that paper will read that comment, and they will hate me for it, right? Right. Whereas if there were, you know, a well-developed culture, well, the rest of the community would see that comment as well, and they <laughs> would give me kudos if I was actually right about it. Well, then maybe uh, the indirect benefits can be enough to make that shift, can push us over that transition. Right. Right, and I feel like there's an element to be played there. Uh, there's an element of collaborative culture and collaborative science to be played uh, in all of that. That if we kind of shift, it's a mindset set shift, right? It's the mindset of, um, I'm going to go in and my job as a reader is to tear, or a reviewer is to tear this piece apart. And so that's one way you can go in and take a look at a piece and say, well, this is awful, and here are the reasons why it's awful, versus a more constructive collaborative um, point of view of saying, I'm going to go into this paper, and this paper has some serious problems, and let's discuss them. Because if those problems are solved, we all benefit. You know, right. any given piece of data, a piece of data may not tell you what a particular analysis, what you think it tells you, right? Um, however, that doesn't mean that piece of data and that analysis, that, that the data itself needs to be thrown out. It may mean that there's a conversation to be had to improve the analysis, to improve an argument. Um, and I feel like we all benefit from that. Uh, it's a cultural shift. It's definitely a cultural shift. We're not, <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but in, we're, I, I, in, in science, I wasn't necessarily taught about proper constructive <laughs> criticism. And I definitely uh, have some colleagues that, that maybe could have benefited from some English classes that discuss uh, constructive criticism versus destructive criticism. Um, but it's a cultural shift that, you know, it, it benefits everybody. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I think that perhaps we're learning a bit from the couple journals that have experimented with the open peer review and have found it to be a more effective peer review, is that, you know, the alternatives are not the discussion has to be this paper is trashed or this paper is fantastic and everyone should read it. But if we could have a bit more, you know, seriously nuanced discussion about this is a, there was a great idea and this would be an important paper, you know, if we could fix these, these methodological flaws. And I think we've already seen that in those, you know, the peer review that pre-publication peer reviews that get published have mm -hmm. been able to show, you know, look, people that particularly if they're attaching their names to them are writing reviews that tend to be longer, they tend to have better grammar, this comes from biology direct, I think, they tend to, you know, be more constructive as well as, you know, nitpicking about, mm -hmm. should have fixed this and you should have done my favorite statistical test, like, perhaps <laughs> we can get there too. Well, you know, everybody should just use structural equation modeling, so I don't really see why it's an issue. Uh, so, so what is the role of switching gears a little bit? Um, so I know all of us are on Twitter, um, we all engage on talking about papers and links. You know, it's, it doesn't seem like a whole lot of sort of post-publication review goes on there, <laughs> other than sharing links, or, or what do you guys think? What's well, 140 role? characters. Yeah. What more do you need? <laughs> <laughs> Paper is bad. Paper yes, is great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's about that, uh, what Jared was saying. It's about the discovery. It's, it's really not about the discussion at all, but right. connecting you to people. Um, mm -hmm. And then once you, you know, oh, so-and-so seems to be reading a lot, then you, you get a bit deeper. You follow their blog. You catch something um, mm -hmm. that, that takes you to that next level of discussion. It's, it's really just, in my mind, it's that big net of, of catching stuff to find out that, hey, so I'm missing something that's, in, that's important. And it's, and it's, again, it's on that important side more than the validity side. Maybe that validity discussion is happening elsewhere. You know, but, but I, I, and I think the, you raised this point, but maybe you didn't say it explicitly, or maybe I'll just repeat you. Uh, like, part of, the, part of the hard thing is discovering where those validity in addition to discovering papers, you might not know about this filtering thing that, that you brought up. Uh, the, the validity part of post-publication rate peer review may be hard to discover as well. Uh, and so it seems like it's, it's equally useful for, 
for both of those. Um, yeah. Perhaps it's more useful for one than the other. I'm not, I'm not sure. Right. Yeah, I don't so, think you're getting validity checking in Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so I don't, uh, Scott, I don't know if you had uh, more points you wanted to raise, but I would. I, so I like this this uh -huh. dichotomy that Carl brings up of filtering versus validity, and I feel like when I hear the phrase post-publication peer review, I hear validity um, more than I hear filtering. But when I, when I think of, of these things like blogs and Twitter in particular, um, I, I find they're more, they're probably more useful for filtering <laughs> than they are for for validity checking. And should we really ex expect? I mean. I think we, we should have the right to expect that they're great for it, to interact with people, to, to discuss validity, to start to think about it, but do we really want, we want uh, stuff in the peer-reviewed literature to come out of that like it did with the, the Arsenic Life in order to sort of really move science forward? Is, is that a valid perspective, do you guys think? I, I claimed on Twitter a while ago that most publication peer review is a certain science, like, that's sort of what science is. It's like each peer-reviewed piece of paper is not the truth. Science is a process for discovering the truth, and we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't expect like like I saw the other day someone on, re on retraction watch or something commenting that some old piece of science that happened to be wrong should be retracted. That <laughs> most science is wrong, especially older science in some sense, but we, we get there by by churning, churning along and saying how it's wrong and getting it down there in the archival literature. So I don't know what do you guys think about that perhaps heretical take on post-publication peer review. The take that everything should work like the arsenic life process? Or <laughs> uh, that it's, it's useful insofar as it results in more contributions to the peer-reviewed literature that, that set forth perhaps the validity concerns that are, are raised maybe in other fora. So that's a filtering process that, you know, re-engages the, the scientific process on particular questions, and that scientific process brings to, to bear the, the questions of validity as it turns along. Mm -hmm. that, that sounds pretty good to me, um, and I think that it's the, perhaps it's the filtering process is the one that needs the most, um, the most attention. Uh, science is growing very much faster than any one individual reviewer can keep up with, um, or any one scientist, right? So you need to be able to discover what's important. And I think gone are the days when you can rely on a journal to, to do that, despite the fact that the journals are often converting their own peer review into primary filter role, right? We'll accept 10% of papers, well, of the 90% we're rejecting, most are on what ground? Scientific validity or on not exciting enough for our magazine? And perhaps plus one being the obvious exception there. But if we do go to that step, then well, where is the, the importance filtering going? And so if that's perhaps a big role for post-publication peer review. That's both networked and peer review to step in. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the whole idea of, of using post-publication peer review to filter in order to shape a conversation and shape the work that you're going to do, um, I feel like that's the most valuable thing it can do. Um, having a post-publication peer review system that allows one to really know not only what's going on, but what is everybody in their field thinking about. Um, how does everybody in sort of the immediate subfield around you react to a single paper? And then how can that guide research to be better, more efficient, and to get more interesting work done. I, I, you know, I feel like that's a huge role that it can play if done correctly. So uh, someone, someone emailed me um, a comment or suggestion they thought that a good sort of, so we have this sort of, uh, you know, peer-reviewed comment that's on a paper and then the original authors um, submit their letter, but he suggested something in between where you know, uh, you submit a, a comment on a, on, a, on a paper and it gets published, and just, just looked at by the handling uh, associate editors in the journal or the chief editor, um, and then that gets published within you know, one or two days, just check for sort of validity, um, or, you know, it's done, uh, done okay, and then sort of put up. And so that would be sort of, and probably assigned to DOI. So that would be in between, you know, thorough peer review and tweeting and blogging and it would give you sort of incentive for, for uh, 
this post publication. Well, I think you're right. It really comes down to an incentive question. I mean, all of the parts of peer review do, and I think we don't always address the incentives quite well enough, right? The journal is the one that's probably the weak link on an incentive structure in which the authors don't don't review it because everybody's going to blame them. Like, why did you let your platform become a a place where so and so could attack my paper unfairly? I think the journal is mostly protecting itself when it says you can write a letter in response, but we're going to show it to the authors that you know who we've already published. Uh, and then similarly, you look on the side of the people engaging in the review process. So what's the, in the incentive to engage in that process, right? I mean, of course, we all love talking about science and you know, engaging in our science, but doing so in that public forum, you're like, well, it's in a published journal and I have some acknowledgement, I've got that record, that helps. Maybe that's not the only incentive, maybe that incentive is, is overemphasized. Perhaps my goal is to get the attention of certain people in my field. Uh, rather than to get the credential on my CV. But, mm -hmm. I wonder to what extent, so you're kind of talking about an editorial review only, right? Right. Yeah, so I'm going to throw this link in here. Um, I mean, kind of what you're talking about is um, there's an experiment about this kind of ongoing. It hasn't really seen, I'm not sure what the, the number of submissions has been yet, but Chris Lordy just launched a journal called Immediate Science Ecology, uh, which is a kind of an editorial review only uh, journal. I mean, that's what it is. It's open access. Um, the idea behind the journal, I'm just kind of looking at the page, is um, it's a place where you can get is something kind of correct editorially. Can you look at something and say, yeah, this is something that's correct. It should get out there if only so that the data and results are available for meta-analyses. Um, and I know Chris kind of pitched it as a really great place for undergraduate honors students or chap you know, the, the lost chapter of your dissertation that will never get published somewhere else. Um, it's correct, but no one finds it interesting. Um, or that kind of thing, where really it's a place to build up a lot of uh, great data, some really great grist for the mill for future meta-analyses. Um, you know, I'm not sure what uh, Chris's position is on using that as a place for um, ideas and commentaries, et cetera. I mean, I don't know if ideas in ecology and evolution, Lonnie Arson's journal fills that niche. Um, but ISE, it's, it's an editorial review journal, so maybe that's kind of, maybe that might be an interesting direction that journal can take. Uh, and I put, I'll throw the link to it in the conversation on the side of the chat. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll add that to the uh, YouTube. Great, great. Yeah, and then it's the, the second question of, you know, how does the community start viewing those, those kinds of contributions, right? I think we see the most letters um, to the editor kind of back and forth discussion, at least ones that I'm most familiar with are the ones on the sort of the Glamour magazine end, mm -hmm. right? Because, well, if you're going to spend time, you know, putting your neck out there and writing about how someone is wrong, like, uh -huh. it's, it's so much more worth doing that if it's going to end up in a place that has that kind of name brand mm -hmm. at, the, at the moment. I'd be curious, yeah, if a, if a journal could really make a name posting those kinds of things as, yeah. a, as a more focus. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if ISC is suited for that or if that's even Chris's idea, but... Uh, you know, that's the only ecology journal I can think of that has that editorial peer review model out there. Um, so, interesting. Yeah. Be curious to hear from Chris. Of course, he's across the hall, so who knows what, uh, <laughs> he'll come running in here in a minute. <laughs> so what about, what about uh, I thought the retraction watch is a pretty interesting uh, example of sort of... I oh, hold on. <laughs> Chris is banging on my door. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> um, so the uh, is, is a good example of sort of the consequence of uh, post-publication peer review. You know, uh, you see some mistake in a in a paper, and then uh, you contact the authors of the journal, and, and some and sometimes it gets retracted. So it seems like that's sort of an important role that post-publication peer review has. Anyway, sort of yeah. like the arsenic life is a, is a good example of that. Yeah, yeah. So it seems like it's, it's I hope it's, you know, so stuff like that will keep keep going. Uh, and uh, It seems like definitely the retractions have, have picked up. Uh, and I, I feel like it's picked up more in the bigger journals. Mm -hmm. um, and retraction or not, it's, it's kind of a matter of keeping it, those pieces coupled together, right? Like as Jamie said, retraction might be a bit black and white for a lot of this content. Maybe it's very important for, you know, uh, claiming a particular gene might be the 
connection to cancer, and you know the retraction hinges on whether or not there will be a huge study allocated to that. But for you know the rest of our more esoteric scientific process, we we need a black and a less black and white way to say you know there's value to this paper, but there's also flaws to this paper, and that doesn't mean it needs to be retracted. But we also need retracted or not a way to connect it back to the original literature. You know, Nature and Science now will at least tag you know, somewhat subtly, oh, this is a second version of this paper if there's been some small correction or that this has been retracted. But for the large part, you could be reading an article that's retracted without having any way to, to realize that that has happened. So right. kind of connecting those pieces is a, is a more important so part. So I think Crossref has a tool called Crossmark, I believe. Um, I'll put the link in that has like, it's sort of like a little JavaScript or jQuery uh, little button on the side. Uh, journal websites, and you can sort of—I think it'll link like updates to the paper if there's a retraction. Hmm. Kind of I'm, so. I'm browsing through Retraction Watch, and I don't see an ecology. There's evolution. There are three papers that are tagged as evolution, but I don't see anything for ecology. Oh, environmental retractions. One. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Oh, and I got an email from Chris. Uh, he says ideas in ecology and evolution is for commentary. Um, again, I don't know if it's editorial only or not. ISC is really much more for data, so put that up. Okay. Nice. Um, yeah, so it seems like maybe there's not a lot of retractions in, in our biology and evolution because people aren't looking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or is there just that we do science so well that there's never any mistakes? <laughs> well, we are ecologists. Right. <laughs> uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It'd be interesting to ask the retraction watch people. Yeah. Hmm. So, um, so I wonder if we could leverage like the the, um, the hallway conversations and stuff like that. You know, if everybody had a like Carl, I know you have a really active uh, open lab notebook, and I wonder if you sort of. I mean, there's you're not going to get DOIs for that, but uh, if people sort of talked about you know, discussions of papers in their lab notebooks. Some of that stuff could be put out to the public and used. Yeah, there's a couple of venues where I think that people have flirted with this idea of this taking the hallway discussion online. I mean, the privacy barrier aside, um, this seems like there's a good question of like where that discussion should occur, right? So all of the journals have at some point tried experimenting with the online comments. PLOS has always had online comments. You know, there is some stuff there that I've always been ignored. The other extreme nature did a, I think, a one-year experiment with the online comments and, you know, at the end said, look, we're shutting this down. People don't use it. This is not where those discussions occur. Uh, a bit more lively place has been in the, you know, the discussion feeds in blogs, right, where there's been some exchange, sometimes very lengthy exchange on certain papers, particularly if they have more immediate consequence to political events, for instance, uh, saying this paper is valid, this paper is not valid, right? Um, so more lively discussion and discussion comments. Um, Mendeley has now kind of stepped into that space in a couple ways. Um, so Ethan Perlstein's lab allows you to comment on Mendeley papers, um, tries to promote discussion on his website. Meanwhile, like the Mendeley platform of the ability to create either a public or a private group and kind of you know, share your paper and share sticky notes about, hey, this sentence is ridiculous and uh, what a great statement and whatever else down to you know, sharing the nitty gritty. So there's, there's more ways to do that. Some of that is uh, finding its way to the light of day directly. Um, some of it is probably best that like, there is an option to do that in a, in a hidden way. I think Mendeley is, for instance, maybe interested in eventually kind of exposing that kind of stuff on aggregate, if not like revealing your individual comments. But, oh, this paper has been a highly discussed paper. There's also uh, Utopia Docs, which is an interesting platform. It's a desktop application for uh, Macs and PC, uh, where once you, first off, it's really cool in that it, it pulls up a lot of accompanying information about any paper. So any paper you load into that, any PDF, as long as it can find the DOI or identifying information, it pulls up some really great uh, additional information, citations, uh, links to PubMed, links to all metrics. Uh, I'm not sure if it does total impact yet, but it, it, you know, it pulls up all of that kind of metadata about a paper 
Um, at the same time, if you have an account at Utopia Docs, um, you can, it allows you to annotate PDFs, and then once you have an account with Utopia Docs, those annotations of that PDF can actually turn into conversations with other users at Utopia Docs. Um, I'm seeing on Twitter the, the uh, author of it is saying that the API isn't quite ready for prime time yet, so hopefully that'll get there, uh, which could make, a, uh, make it a really interesting platform to interact around. Um, but uh, it, it's currently, I think, a really nice, it's a really nice platform for PDF annotation, um, at least on your desktop. So um, I wonder if, so I'm just going to throw this out there. It's probably a crazy idea, but um, <laughs> um, so what if, what if we, so if, if, if post-publication becomes, replaces or becomes, replaces your, uh, pre-publication uh, review or is, is very important relative to peer, uh, pre-publication, do we have uh, versions of papers? You know, do we basically have versioning of scientific papers? And, but it's, it seems like there wouldn't be a whole lot of incentive to do that because you don't get another publication for the second version of a paper, or do you get like partial credit or something like that? It's something the publishers have certainly had their eye on. I mean, Elsevier kind of addressed it in its grand paper challenge. I think it was Springer that had liquid papers. Maybe I'm confusing them. Um, where a paper would be a more dynamic document and have that kind of discussion. Um, sounds like there is primarily the cultural challenges of us, you know, not being used to that, right? As you just said, why would I do it if it's not another paper? Mm -hmm. Rather than kind of the, the formatting to have that kind of discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as is the post-publication going to take over the role, if it's just taking over the role of filtering and, you know, journals are taking only the role of, you know, scientific validity, for instance, then perhaps that's less of an issue. You don't necessarily expect all the articles to be being revised. But as Jamie kind of postulated, you'll hear more commentary on those articles in the published literature attacking their validity. But that post-publication is taking over the response of saying, this is what everyone should be reading, rather than two editors uh, or reviewers saying, this is, you know, what everyone should be reading. I can of course, that's had a, a tough start, too, with things like Faculty of a Thousand trying to, you know, move more into that space and say, there, there's a service now, we do it. And of course, the journals have a long time before they'll be replaced in that role. Yeah, I'm very curious to see where F1000 research goes. Um, it's certainly kind of trying, seems to be merging sort of the Faculty of 1000 model with kind of a much more open post-publication peer review model. So certainly um, kind of leveraging that uh, uh, the, the sort of goodwill or the, the brand name that they've built up for themselves into a more dynamic post-publication discussion. Um, I mean, F1000 right now, it's, it's discussion. It's discussion amongst uh, the people that have been selected to be part of the faculty of 1,000 or 10,000 or however many are actually there right now. Um, so I don't know. That, that might be one of those services that, that could do it. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I think we are kind of waiting for that killer app or that killer sort of um, that thing that's going to challenge us to maybe think about our culture and try something a little bit different and actually give us the incentives to do it. And I'm, I'm curious what that's going to be, um, but it seems to be in the air, as it were. I mean, uh, I, I think the, the focus on open access in general has made us question issues of access to the entire, uh, really to the whole scholarly publishing enterprise. What part should be open, what part should be closed? I, I think that's been a really productive uh, element of the open access debate that hasn't really been recognized. So I, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see uh, who is able to jump in on that, um, that killer app for scholarly publishing um, and where that goes. I think we're, we're going to get there. Just for the sake of being contrary, maybe um, <laughs> rather than a killer app, I think there's we, we might also anticipate a more diffuse solution that uh -huh. you know we, people have tried for a long time to say like this is the location for scholarly discussion and comments, and we've always gone back instead to our more human networks, and now social networking for the first time has kind of emulated some of those human networks online, and those discussions have been much more successful, and the discussions in the comments on the journal publisher's website. There is order of magnitude or more discussion that occurs on people's natural social networks that they've already built on their Facebook or on their Twitter or on their blogs. That's 
where they go to talk about these things. And if a journal or faculty thousand or whoever can step in and kind of leverage that, or these alt metrics can help us like find or discover that, perhaps uh, it's a more promising solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I think that's why I threw out the idea of the killer app. That we all have our own individual social or professional networks, and those will work well. But what's really going to do it, what's really going to enhance discoverability is if there's a way we can bring those networks together yes. um, and then sort of leverage the power of, of that. And that's something that you can only do through um, either a single platform or something that overlays multiple platforms and kind of draws them together. And that, that's what I think would be phenomenal and, and could affect a real cultural change. Yeah, I'm really, really interested to see. So um, it seems like with, you know, with QJ as an example of sort of people call it, you know, like the Silicon Valley people, startup people are getting into the publishing industry now. <laughs> and sort of, you know, if they're for profit, you know, are they really going to have incentive to open up their, their data through an API? Um, and if they don't, then, you know, it's going to be hard to collate um, content and data, comments, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see. It sounds like it seems like we're going to get a, a you know flourishing of sort of uh, publishers and publishing models, but some of them are going to be open, some of them are going to be closed, and it seems like it's going to be a big challenge to to have that killer app that's going to put everything together. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's an exciting competition. Time. It's probably a good thing between different systems, right. and you know, yeah. we'll see what 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 takes. Yeah, I think it's an exciting time. I'm I'm kind of curious to see what the next you know two to three years hold as, as people start to really play around with different models. Um, I think Pure J, uh, I'm really curious how they're going to do. I think, if anything, they've thrown something really disruptive in terms of conversations about pricing. I mean, I, feel, I think that a lot of the efforts that are going on right now, some will succeed, some will fail, as so often happens. But if anything, they're kind of disrupting the, the sort of traditional uh, practice and causing us to ask a lot of really good introspective questions about uh, how do we want this to work? I mean, it's why we're having this discussion, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, Jamie, did you have anything else to add? Um, not that I can think of off the top of my head. I had no more no more burning statements. <laughs> <laughs> Car Carl or Jared, anything? No, thanks for the discussion. Yeah, yeah thanks. Thanks. This okay. has been really great. Yeah. Cool. Okay, well, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll uh, talk again soon, hopefully. Yeah, definitely. Talk to you soon. Cheers. Bye. Bye.